Good morning, Oasis. Thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're in person or online, let's just stand up and praise Him. Hallelujah. What a joy it is to praise Him. Amen. to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for to save us whoever believes in him will live forever cross Jesus is waiting there with open arm singing open arm for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever
saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. There's a lot of things that we can look at that are fearful or worrisome. Before this moment, let's sing and look at Jesus because he's beautiful.
Whatever you 
Help to expand our vision to see Jesus, to turn our eyes, to fix our eyes, to fix our attention on Jesus. We just love you. And we just give you all the praise and honor and glory this morning because you deserve it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We're so glad that you're with us. Um, Pastor Fred's going to be welcoming us and giving us some announcements this morning. Hey, you may be seated. It's good to see you guys today, whether you're watching online and everybody here. It's good to see you guys this morning, amen? It's a good day. You believe that? Some of us do. I believe it is a good day today, amen? No matter what your week was like, God is still in control. He's going to see you through. Hey, I just want to um, thank you for being here this morning, be a part of what we're doing. A couple quick announcements that we're going to dive right into the word this morning. Uh, we have our pursuit that is taking place, I believe it's next weekend. We do have, if you're looking to uh, get your child registered, you can check that out. There are people outside to do that. Also, food and, uh, our Rawway Food and Family, uh, Food and Friends, uh, we have these uh, bags that are somewhere here that I normally have. I don't know where it went, but we have a bag that we've been talking about. There's the bag. Thank you very much. And um, so anyways, it, we have these in the back. And so for our local congregation here, you guys, uh, if you'd like to join us with this, there's a, only a small uh, amount of bags that are left. We're collecting and filling these up uh, so that you can bring them back next Sunday. It's going to the, uh, the Rawway Food and Friends. They're doing a, a great work. In fact, they lost, I believe, pretty much everything that they had with the flood that we had last week. Uh, and so we're helping restock, and this is all going to help feed uh, families here locally in Rawway and, and then from there outside of that. But help us make a big impact in our community. We're looking to really just overwhelm them with food to be able to really impact them in a greater way and really help help our community, amen, and just show the love of Jesus and what we're doing. And then also, another thing that we do have, uh, Circles Registration is, is taking place today. It's open, so uh, we want to invite you to be part of our small groups. That's our, what we call our circles. Um, there are ones in different communities as well as in some of the building here and a couple online, so check those out. You can go to oasisnj.net slash join circle, and they'll have information for you with that. Join up today. They do go get filled up fast, so um, you'll see all those things on our social media and, and join that, be a part of that. And then lastly, I just want to say a big, big thank you uh, to your giving and what you do in supporting the ministry. Uh, thank you whether you're giving online, uh, those of you giving electronically, or whether it's picking up the envelopes and the things that we have out in the foyer. Thank you for being a part of it. It enables us to continue to do our work as far as reaching out to the mission stuff that we continue to support as well as the local things that we do, and also just to keep the basic stuff running, which is a good thing, too. It's always nice to have that happen, but uh, thank you for doing that. But anyways, we're going to dive right into the Word of God this morning in a brand new series today, um, and I'm excited about it. It's going to go um, for about a total of six weeks. Seems like a lot. We've got some good stuff we're going to plug into it. You know, in a world that seems to be more and more empty of faith, um, as followers of Jesus, I, I strongly believe that we need to be full of faith in our life. There's so many things that are constantly pulling back and, and saying, you know, try to take Jesus out of the picture, try to take this out of the picture. And you say, and it's like this. If you stand up and say, hey, I'm a Christian, they're like, oh, people are like, oh, okay, let me, let me back away from you, you know, and, or whatever. It's not the, the popular thing necessarily to do or to be, but the reality is that in a world, as I said, that's more and more empty of faith, I think it's for you and I as, as Christ followers is to make it a point to really be, have a life that's full of faith, to stand in the midst no matter what the circumstances are in our day-to-day -day life. A faith that enables you to sustain no matter the joy, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situations that you're going through, to really see the ability of God working in your life. You know, I was thinking about this as I was preparing, and uh, I was thinking about my dad. My dad, he, uh, he was a pastor. For those of you who don't know, he has to actually pastor this church for uh, 10, about, about 10 years. Yeah, he was a pastor here. Uh, before I did, and um, I tell you, he was, he was an incredible man of God. He was an incredible person of faith, really. Um, pastor churches in Pennsylvania as well as in South Carolina, and, you know, just to see his life as, as a kid growing up, me and my siblings, and watching our dad, and really the faith that he had to stand in the midst of no matter what the situations were, through the struggles that they went through just as, uh, you know, when I was little, and, and how they continued. He's pastoring two churches 
I don't even know how he did it. He had two, pastored two churches in the same day. You go speak at one, and then you get in the car, and they drive all the way to another city, and, and it was two little small churches, and he was faithful to that and how God provided and did so many things in their life. Uh, and, but he had this faith that no matter what the situation was, he knew that God was going to be there. He knew that God was going to move in the situation. No matter what the situation may be, whether the situation came out good or whether it was not the expected, you know, destination or the expected result, the fact was his, his faith was immovable. We saw that over and over, not only in, in trusting and believing God to supply, you know, for our family and to help this and to go through this. My brother, when he was, when he was born, uh, he, he died from highline membrane disease and um, in other words, it, I guess all the things that, are in, that normally come out when the baby's born, he swallowed it. It went into his lungs, collapsed his lungs, and they had all these things they had to do to him, and he died. And, um, you know, it was legally dead. And then, you know, we had all these people praying from Canada to South Carolina and the United States, all these different places, and just believing that God was going to work through it. And I remember my dad, the faith that he had, and just trusting that, God, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do this. You're going you're gonna to bring us through. And my brother came back to life, and they all told us that, hey, you know what? He's going to have all this, like, you know, brain injury because there was so the, the, the length of time that he was that he was without oxygen is gonna, has definitely damaged his brain and all these things. And and yet, that never changed the fact of his faith that God, you're going to take care of him. And you know, he went through it. I remember he was even, you know, when he was going to school and how that. I remember it was the second grade or something like that. And and they were saying, yeah, he's actually on a, on a higher grade level. You know, which I find shocking, to be quite honest, as the older brother. But, you know, you didn't think I was going to go through that without making some kind of dig. You know, but, but anyways, I'm just joking around. But, but the reality was that he, he saw God work in that. And that was the kind of faith that he had. So we lived with that. We saw that. We saw God just do amazing things. But we also saw in the low times, when there was really difficult times, that the faith never wavered. Because what happens many times in our life, what happens, we're trusting God. Oh, yeah, God's got this. But the moment things hit rock bottom, it's like, God, who? We never saw our Father do that. And so for me, that instilled so much faith in my life when I stepped into to pastoring that I didn't even realize, realize it. But there was, there's things, that opportunities that we got in. And all of a sudden, that faith that I saw in action, that it really was a part of our life. And my brother and my sister you know, we've all been through our own issues and challenges, but in the midst of that, that, that's just that how that God worked through his example and embedded that into our life to be able to stand in the face, in the, in the face of situations that have been really challenging throughout all of our lives. A faith that is full, that's full and on top of the mountain when everything is going good, when the joy is there, and, but also a faith that is still stable despite what's happening in the life whether it's just the, not what I wanted, but I'm still able to stand. See, that's the kind of faith that I believe that we as Christ followers have to have. Not this roller coaster faith that, yeah, yeah, I'm all high on, on Jesus when everything's going good, but the moment that it dips down, I'm like, I'm out of here. That is not the faith that we're called to walk in. That's not the faith that we're called to live our life in, but amazing faith that is never-ending, with a never-ending confidence that no matter what, God is in control, that he holds my life, he he, he shapes every choice, every decision in my life, that, that he's in control because he's holding my life. He's going to see me through. He's going to be with me in the good, the bad, the ups, the downs, the ins, the outs, the, 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 what, I, what I wanted to see as the result and what I didn't maybe wanted to see as the result. That, God, you're still with me, and you're going to lead me through this. When David talked about the fact in the Old Testament that, uh, that, that, that God was with him as he walked through the shadow of the valley of death, he's not going to fear any evil. He's going he's to hold fast. There's times in life we're going through those things that we don't like, but do we have a faith that is able to stand, an amazing faith that's going to hold fast? And this is the type of faith that we should be full of. How do we get that kind of faith? We're going to take over the next five weeks talking about that. You know, today we're going to do an intro to it, talk, just kind of lay some foundation. Listen, foundations are never the great thing. I mean, if, you were to go to, if you're going to go look at a house and you maybe want to buy a house like that, you know, usually everybody wants to look at the bathrooms, the kitchens. They want to look at the walls and the windows. You don't say, hey, can I go look at the basement? You need to look at the basement at a house because we looked at, we, there's one that we didn't look at and almost put an offer in many, a long, long time ago and it had a cracked foundation. It was a mess and all that stuff. But usually the, the, the high thing on our list, if you go to visit somebody, look, man, you know what? I'm here. I love this new house, but I really want to go see what your basement looks like. We don't want to see the basement. We don't want to see the foundation. But the foundation is critical. 
And so today my endeavor and what I'm praying God will help me is to lay a foundation that we, from that foundation, that we understand that we can build on. And we'll take the next five weeks looking at some key things. You know, as a pastor, you know, I'm constantly, you know, looking uh, to grow. I'm constantly listening and, and, and drawing from other ministries and listening to the, the, the other teachers and things like that. Because just as you're here and I'm feeding you, I have to feed myself. Right, that's important. You know, that'd be like, the, you know, whoever whoever made the meal in your house, and whether it's mom or dad or whoever, grandma, whatever, whoever's there, and you know, they're like, I'm just serving everybody else, but I, you know, I'm just not going to eat. You guys eat it, and they never eat. They're not going to have the strength to make the meal the next time, right? Because they need to finally sit down and eat, right? You with me? You understand what I'm saying? It's like you got to eat. You can give, 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 but if you're not replenishing, you're not going to have anything to give. And and so, you know, we ran across a series that that really inspired me, and, and I know Pastor Chris was also listening to it at the same time, and, you know, and it challenged, uh, it challenged in our conversations, and so incorporating a lot of that from it was North Point Church, and, and uh, really plugging a lot of it, adding our own stuff into it, but some things that said, you know, we need to give this into people's lives, because we need to talk about this subject of living a life that is filled with faith, not an up and down faith, but a solid faith that enables you to get through every challenge and situation in your life. So let's lay the foundation today as we build on this. Uh, when, you look through the, when you look through the Gospels, we see that um, as you follow Jesus, you, you see that there's only two times that we see listed. And we don't know if there was more, but there's only two times that's actually written down that Jesus was amazed or marveled at something. And so when you go and break it down, the first one is this. Matthew chapter 8, we see Jesus, he's, he's walking into this town called Capernaum, and so he's here in Capernaum, and so this, this Roman centurion walks up to Jesus and asks him to heal um, this, uh, his, his servant that is at, back at home. He, he, he doesn't want the, the, the guy to die, and he's, he's, he's come to Jesus, to hunt Jesus down so that he could heal him so that he'll live. And so Jesus offers to go to the guy's house, and the guy says, no, 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 you know what? He says, Jesus, I really don't need you to do that because I really kind of know how this all works. I no doubt he had watched him. No doubt he understood and seen Jesus praying for people and different things. And he understands there's more working than what anybody else was seeing here. And so if we pick it up, Matthew chapter 8, verse 9. He says, but the Roman officer interjected. He said, Lord, who am I to have you come into my house? I understand your authority, for I too am a man who walks under authority and have authority. So understand this. He's saying, I'm a man under authority. His authority was the Roman government, the Roman empire. So he's... He has that authority is over him, and he's responsible to speak into them and carry out what they say. But he says, I'm also a man that has authority. In other words, there's people, as he was going to say, over soldiers who serve with me. I can tell one to go, and he'll go, and another to come, and he'll come. I command my servants, and they'll do whatever I ask. So I know that all you under, that I, I'm sorry. So I know that all you need to do is to stand here and command healing over my son, and he will be instantly healed. Now, you have to think, that's, that's a big deal. This guy is not even, he's, he's not Jewish, so he's not the people that Jesus is speaking to. He's a Roman centurion, which is the oppressor, right? So you to understand all the pictures within those things. So this is the case with that. We, we look at the scenario, and we're like, okay, so, you know, all right, he's talking to Jesus and offers to go to his house and these kind of things. I'm sure people were thinking, but why would you go to his house? Because he's like, he's a Gentile. We don't, we don't, we don't deal with him. But see, they don't, and so what we see in the, in the situations is they, um, he, him talking about the fact is, what he's saying about the people that are under him, he's saying, listen, they don't obey me because of me. It wasn't because this guy had great skill and great this or great that. He said, they obey me because of the authority that I'm under. He says, I'm not just speaking for me, I'm, I'm speaking for Rome. And because I'm speaking for Rome, it's not me speaking, it's Rome speaking. And they'll do it because Rome don't play right? Rome does not play. They will string you up. They'll nail you up. They're going to torture you. They'll do whatever. So you better follow what I'm saying because it's not me going to get after you. It's going to be Rome that's going to get after you under that authority. Okay, so, so Jesus clearly, you know, when he looks at him, he clearly, when the centurion clearly looks at Jesus, he really understands the fact that there's something bigger that's going on here. And he says in verse 10, Jesus says this, Jesus was astonished when he heard this. And said, if those who were follow, if, and said to those that were following him, he has greater faith than anyone I've encountered in all of Israel. Greater faith. 
that's kind of a slam to everybody he's talking to right there and even the guys that are following him that here's this Gentile Roman centurion that has greater faith than even the people that are following him right now so what was it what was it that was so amazing about this guy Jesus was amazed by this big bold active faith that he had the Gentile centurion he connected all the dots he recognizes the authority of Jesus See, Jesus didn't marvel at his, in his knowledge. He didn't marvel at his skill. He didn't marvel at his authority. He marvels at his faith of this extraordinary man who was living it out. That literally, in, in, that he acknowledges, he seizes, and this centurion jumps full faith into the fact that, you know what? That this guy, Jesus, he can heal this young guy in my house. He doesn't have to die. He can live. So I'm going to jump full in. How many times have we allowed things to keep us from jumping full in? I, I really believe that as, as Christ followers that we've got to come to a point in our life that we're, we're not playing this game back and forth. You know, the, the church, well, I'm going to church. Six days out of the week, you wouldn't even know I went to church. But I'm in church on Sunday. Amen? Listen, I, you know, I'm, we're talking about a faith. And our endeavor in this is a faith that we are able to walk in every single day. Does it mean you're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Does it mean that everything's going to go right in your life? Absolutely not. But it's a faith that weathers the ups and the downs, the ins and the outs. It's, and so we see Jesus was totally amazed by that. The second thing we see that Jesus was amazed with was in his hometown, Nazareth. So here he goes there, and he's teaching in the synagogue. If you read the story, you'll find that. He's teaching in the synagogue. Then everybody in the synagogue are like, man, this guy's this guy amazing. Listen to him. He's got such great insight. He's got such great depth. And they're amazed. and like, wow, this is, this is pretty incredible. But then as just... Every time something's going good, Satan loves to bring something in just to slither something in to make a mess in the situations. So in this crowd that's listening to Jesus and probably didn't really recognize maybe who he was at the moment and are astonished by what he's saying and it's really resonating with inside, resonating within their heart, someone's like, hey, do you know who that is? You know, that's... That's Jesus. That's Mary's son. You know, that family. She was like pregnant and it was holy, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you remember them, right? And so all of a sudden, gossip comes in and a little jealousy slithers in. You know, you can have gossip. In, you ever know that you can have gossip in church? Yeah, I'll say it again. You ever know that, that you can have gossip in church? You can have gossip in the office place? You can have, gof, uh, off, uh, yeah, you can have gossip in, in your family? Amen, hallelujah. Some of you resonated right there on that. We all deal with that kind of junk. And I guarantee you that anytime jealousy and gossip begins to slither into something, it's always going to keep you away from what God wants to do in your life. As a, as a Christ follower, as a believer, man, we, we got we to gotta draw the line that gossip has no place in my life. That I will not allow jealousy of what someone else has, or gift, or talent, or, or what, what, what they look at this and start comparing your life and allow that to, to come in and, and, and make a mess of your life. Because Satan uses that as a weapon to separate and divide. And so when we move that junk out of our life and not allow it in, because when we do let it in, what we're doing, we are connected to the wrong thing. I need to stay connected to the Holy Spirit in my life. And, and so what we see in this case, we'll see why, what happens here. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, isn't this Mary's son? You're like, wait, wait, hey, wait, hold on a second. Isn't this Mary's son that we, we all know, the carpenter, the brother of Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? And don't his sisters all live here in Nazareth? Some of you are saying, Jesus had brothers and sisters? I thought, I thought Mary only had Jesus. No, Mark chapter 6 says that he had some brothers. And he's got sisters. And they all live here in Nazareth, and they took offense at that. I remember Andrew and I, we were talking about this the other day in the car, my son. And, uh, and he said, Jesus had sisters? I said, yeah, it's right there. And he said, he had brothers? I said, yeah, yeah, he had brothers and sisters. He goes, he goes man, that had to be a messed up family because it's like the pressure they must have all been under because, oh, yeah, my brother's God. That's like, you know, that's like, that's a lot of pressure, you know. <laughs> It's like, we can never be better than Jesus, you know, because he's the star of the family, you know. So anyways, I said, you know what? I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. They probably did have some dysfunctional things in their family, most likely, because, you know, the star of the show, you know. Anyways, and 
not that Jesus is trying to be the star, but you have to humor me a little bit, but I think you know what I'm talking about, especially if you come from a big family. Anyways, what the people are saying, you know, they're, they're talking about, well, he's not special. He's just like one of us. You know, wh- why are you listening to this guy? And, and so what does Jesus do? He responds to them, and he says this, a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. It's amazing. Until they, so they were loving it until they realized that he was, he was Jesus, you know, the carpenter, the one that they used to see run around and play in the yard. Oh, him? Like, what can we learn from him? He was amazed. Verse 6 says this, he was amazed at the depth of their unbelief. Amazed at the depth of their unbelief. Why? Because they began to look at the, the, the human aspect of it and, not, and totally missing what God was wanting to do. In fact, Jesus went there, and it talks about the fact that he was able to pray for a few people and, and, and stuff like that, but he was not able to do any great miracles in their midst. Jesus went there to change lives. He went there to see lives transformed and completely changed, but he couldn't do any of that. Why? Because of their unbelief. He says he was amazed at the depth of their unbelief. Wow, I don't, I don't know about you, but I never want to be, have anybody be amazed at my unbelief. I want faith. I want to be able to walk in that. Faith isn't thinking that everything will be fine and work out. It's not that, well, I'm just, I'm just a hoping and a praying and believing. And I'm not saying praying in that sense. You know, I'm kind of throwing it in the same category as, well, you know, what is that thing we always say, you know, uh, whenever, my condolences and ho- hopes and prayers, hopes and prayers, hopes and prayers, just, or whatever, we throw these things out sometimes. And not really praying and not really hoping. But hope, hoping and me um, wishing and thinking that maybe it'll work out is not faith. It, it, there's a difference between that. You know, I, I heard there was a friend of mine that lives in another country and, and um, on the other side of the world, actually. And uh, so I was, I, her father had died. So I went on her, on her page to, you know, to just comment and tell her, you know, hey, I'm praying for you and your family. And, and uh, so I'm just kind of look, looking at some of the other posts that were there because it's in another country, speaking another language. And uh, some of them I couldn't read. It was, it was not Spanish. I could read some Spanish, stuff like that, but it, this is not Spanish. It, it was actually Turkish. And so I was just, just kind of translating some of the things that it said. And, and it was like, there's so many people that are talking about, well, he's in the light now and, you know, just sending out positive vibes and positive energy and all these kind of things. And I can understand it's a, it's a Muslim country. Okay, so whatever. But you know what hit me was I hear so many people, to, like so many people in the United States that is a country where you know Christianity and even Christians at times talking about, well, I'm just sending out positive vibes and, and energy and light. You know that Jesus is not the, the, the electric company? I mean, as a Christian, I'm not sending out positive energy. I'm not sending out positive light. If, if, if I'm saying that I'm a, a Christ follower, Jesus is not the electric company. What am I connected to? If I'm connected to Jesus, I need to be able to understand that, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for peace. I'm praying for God's comfort, that he's wrapping you in his arms, that he is with you through this whole thing. I don't need, you know, vibes and floating and, and this or all that kind of stuff. And I, listen, I kind of know sometimes people just get tired of putting thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, and no one's thinking or really praying. They're just putting it in there. I think we need to understand what we're connected to. We, we can't be plugged in to other things that sounds trendy and sounds good because it's not connected to Jesus. And if I want a life that is full of it, faith, I've got to be plugged in to where the faith comes from. And listen, if you've done that, I'm not condemning you. I'm just simply saying, because I don't know, and I don't, I don't start to say, okay, who says that? I don't, I don't play those games, so don't worry about that kind of stuff. I don't have time to do that. But if that's what, that's what you use as your sign-off or whatever, I'm just saying you may want to reconsider because if I want to be a representation of Jesus, he's not sending out, you know, positive energy and vibes and good light. And I know the Bible that talks about us being a light, but it's talking about a different, totally different thing. That's, that's so new ages, new age-ish that the moment it comes out of your mouth, it's like crystals are flying out with it. It's just kind of all, I'm sorry, I'm probably treading on people's things right now. But anyways, that's okay because we're talking about Jesus today. Amen? You with me? Okay. So let's continue where I was before I got on my little soapbox up here. Um, faith isn't thinking that everything's going to be just fine. That's, that's hope. That's optimism. So that Jesus was amazed at the centurion's faith in him. The centurion's faith in Jesus is what amazed him, that he knew 
that Jesus had this authority just to speak the word and he would be healed, even though he wasn't even in a way. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the, in the, the person or the things. I know as, as a pastor, well, you know, I got to talk to the pastor. You know, I, I tell people sometimes the one you may want need prayer for is not me. Maybe it's the other, it's, maybe it's somebody else is standing up there. You know, because God can work through them. It's not about the person. It's not about the vessel. It's what's in the vessel. And if we're, as a vessel, all have the same spirit of God alive inside of us, it doesn't make, you can pray for someone where you are. You don't even have to go hunt. I need to hunt down someone holier than me. Listen, if you got the spirit of God alive inside of you and the Holy Spirit is flowing through, you know, you need to be able to understand that you can pray. The Bible says wherever two or more are gathered in his name and agree upon anything, God's power there. There's power in his presence right there that you can pray and God's power can be just as strong as anybody that you've ever seen on TV or heard anything about. Me? Little old me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know why? He wants to work through your life. He wants your life to be full of faith and power where that you know that you know that you know God. You're living inside of me. I want my life to be filled and full with your faith alive inside of my life. On the night of Jesus' rest, he was in a conversation with his disciples, and he told them in John 14, 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, think about this. He, he's saying, okay, you believe in God. Or do you, the, the word like you're trusting in God. You're putting your whole self in. It's not just, it's not just well, I, you know, I, you like God or whatever, but literally you're believing, you're trusting, you're putting your whole heart in him. He says, you're doing that with him, but I, what I want you to do is I want you to do the same thing, believe in me, because they need to begin to connect because before you know it, Jesus is going to be out of the picture. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be whipped. He's going to be uh, nailed to a cross, and he's going to be put into a grave, into a tomb, to rise on the third day, but then he's going to be out of here, and these guys need to be trusting in Jesus to have the strength to go through and deal with everything they need to do. And of course, we see the story goes on. You know that they do because they had the experience in the upper room. They have filled with the power of the presence of God. They go out and literally change the known world of that day. And he says, you need to believe in me. And so Jesus is saying to trust me like you trust God. Why? Because Jesus came to show us what God is like, to reveal the true nature of the Father, to correct the wrong assumptions of what God was like. Jesus was so clear at it, in fact, that it was actually offensive to some people. Because it was like, that sounds... You know, that sounds like heresy. He was saying, I want you to obey what God is like. I want you to, I mean, I want to know what God is like. What, to know what God is like, watch me. To know what God is like, listen to what I'm saying. To know what God is like, follow me. Even today, people want to, like, move Jesus out of the scene. And I want to tell you, you can't get to God without Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No woman, no child. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. And so I've got to go through Jesus. And Jesus is saying, if you want to know what the Father is like, because I had a lot of misconceptions of what God was like, and you know, even today in this age, sometimes we can have a lot of misconceptions of what, what God is really like, depending on your background in church or whatever you do. I mean, just sometimes it has nothing to do with the Bible. It has to do with what somebody wrote and dictated that this is how it is. And Jesus says, he was coming to show them God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, and who God is in his life. So Jesus came so that we could know our heavenly, what our heavenly Father was like. Like one day he goes and he's teaching, and he, a guy comes up to him and asks him, in Luke chapter 9, he says, well, who's my neighbor? He's asking who's his neighbor. Well, he's, you know, so to that, that Jewish religious scholar that Jesus responds back to, this guy, who at that time, racism between the Jews and the Samaritans was pretty, pretty strong. They didn't like each other. I'm sure he's not talking about them. He's probably talking about the guy around the corner that, you know, I don't know, like parked his camel in the wrong spot, you know, something like that, one of his Jewish neighbors or whatever. I, I don't know what the case may be. He's saying, well, who's my neighbor? Is the person right next to me? Is the person across the street? Is, my, is it the one that lives in the next city over? Who's my neighbor? Who's my enemy? You know, who am I supposed to be? You know, whatever the case may be. And so Jesus begins to tell this story in this setting of racism between the Jews and the Samaritans, and he tells a story about a guy getting beat up and how that the Jewish priest walked by and another Jewish person walks by, and the only person that came by to help the guy that was beat up was a, a Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, 
who stops, gets the guy up, takes care of him, puts him into a, an inn, pays for his medical needs, and would, if it went over, he was going to pay more. He tells his whole story, and he makes the Samaritan the good guy in the story. I'm sure they weren't that happy about that story. And so when Jesus is answering who your neighbor is, he's redefining neighbor. A neighbor is anyone that, you have a, that has a need that you can meet. That wasn't the answer I'm sure the guy wanted, when he, but what is Jesus doing? He's, he's trying to show them the heart of the Father. The misconception they had is, that, yeah, you just love everybody that's just like you, but outside of that circle, we don't even exist with them. We don't talk to them. Like, that wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking that they were my neighbor when Jesus says, they are your neighbor. Amen? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he talks, he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, because that's how it was. So you, you just love your neighbor, and if you've got an enemy, just hate them, you know, just kind of push them out. And that's kind of how it was for generations, but here's what God is like, Jesus is saying. And he says this, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See, that was radical at that time. But what is he doing? See, in other words, if you want to be like your father in heaven, you have to love your enemies because your father in heaven loves your enemies. You're saying, what does this got to do with having a faith-filled life? Well, because it's the basis of who you're putting your trust in. If you're putting your trust and faith in Jesus, and that's where you're drawing your strength, and you're hating your neighbor, and you're living in racism, are you living in gossip or strife and all the other junks we allow to contain in our life? How are you going to live a faithful life? Jesus is saying, this is what the Father's like. So as you align your life up with this, this faith is going to be alive inside of you. He goes and he says this. He says, you know, he says, Jesus came to, what we see is that Jesus came to reveal the nature of his Father in heaven and to help people trust in him as he really was. They really know this is what God is really like. He's not wanting you just to love the people that you like, love to love and hate the ones that drive you crazy. He says, I want you to love the ones that are driving you a little nuts right now too because I still love them even if they are driving you up the wall. Wow, that's difficult, isn't it? Because we don't like to really love them. We like to push them as far and far away as we can. I'm not saying you got to have lunch with them, but it's the condition of the heart. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there's just some, there's just some people, maybe there's things are happening in your relationship, and it's never going to be like it was. But you got to be able to check the heart because there can't be any hate in there. I can't have the hate and really be serving Jesus at the same time with the magnitude of what I need to do. Does that make sense? If you want to know what God is like, you got to begin with Jesus because Jesus was the perfect representation of the Father. How did Jesus handle this? That's the thing, you know, what, what would Jesus do? WWJD, yeah, I always have to say it out, let's do it. What would Jesus do? Why was that a big deal? Because whatever Jesus did is the demonstration of the heart of the Father. Because it's a demonstration of who our Heavenly Father is. And throughout his ministry, Jesus invited people to place their trust in him as he reflects who God is. So if you want to have a life that's full of amazing faith, it starts with trust. It's, trust is the currency of every relationship. I mean, anyone that's ever had someone violate that trust in a relationship knows exactly what that is. Because it, it's not just, I'm friends with this person, but when you put, when you take in the trust that's part of your life, and even dump that into that person, in that relationship, and when that's violated, it's crushing, it's devastating. I mean, it's mind-blowing. And you know what? It doesn't just go away because you're like, well, we just need to get over that because trust has to be rebuilt. Because, and I, why am I saying that? Because when we, understand, we talk about trusting in Jesus, it's taking that all of our life and plugging in. It's not just me putting a Sunday part of me into Jesus. It's putting a lifestyle how I do life, I'm trusting in Jesus. Jesus, show me how to live this life to honor my Father in heaven. As I watch Jesus, I see what Jesus did, my life is moving forward. Trust is the currency of every relationship. It's not obedience. See, it's, it's not obedience or fear, it's trust. There are people that are feared into a relationship, and 
forced into obedience in a relationship, but how many know there's no love involved in that? Trust is, comes out of love. It comes out of, it's how I, like honestly, when I try to think of how to describe it, I don't even have the words to really describe the trust that when you put in, it's something that's so far above this little kind of surfacey thing. I'm putting my heart into that relationship, into that thing. And this is what Jesus said, for us to give our heart. And Jesus invites people to establish a relationship with God the Father by placing their trust in him. And that begins with making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. It's the simple thing of just asking Jesus Christ in. It starts us on this journey of living a life that's filled with faith. It's trust. Jesus, all the things we talked about, he was reshaping their vision of who God was. Trying to get them to understand he loves you. He even loves your enemy. That's how much he loves people. So when it comes to the point where we receive Jesus Christ as Lord of our life, it's understanding that God, even you, you love me even when you probably shouldn't love me because of who I was or who I am. But he says, that's okay. I love your enemies. I'm going to love you too. I'm going to love people that are not too nice, but I love you too. And I'll forgive you, and I'll fill your life with my presence. But it begins with just an invitation, inviting him in. It's not joining a church. It's not, you know, doing this or doing that. It's not anything you can earn. It's not some type of thing you can, well, if I just say enough of this and do enough of this and buy enough Girl Scout cookies and help somebody out, then I can be saved. No, it has nothing to do with what you can earn or what you can try to do. It has simply with an invitation to say, God, I want to put my heart, my trust in you. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. If you've never made that decision, I invite you to do that today. To make the choice to say, God, I thank you that you sent Jesus so that I could have a relationship with you. So that I could trust you enough to put my faith and hope to know that you want me to know that you're with me till the end. You'll never leave me, never forsake me. So we really can't build faith until we have trust in our God through Jesus Christ. So I want to pray. I want to lead you in a prayer today. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're kind of faithless. Maybe you're kind of going up and down. You're still trying to figure it out. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're, you're, you are a Christ follower today. Let's take the moment to say, God, I come to you give you my life. Forgive me of all the ridiculousness in my life and the things that would separate me from you and make Jesus Christ Lord of my life. Would you just pray this prayer with me? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus that you sent him so that I could have this amazing relationship that you're offering me. I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. In all my failures, in all my shortcomings, I give them to you. And I thank you that you forgive me. I thank you that today, this is a start to a new person, a new creation. That my life is being transformed from the inside to my outside. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that he died for me, rose again, and defeated death, hell, and the grave. And today, I walk in that victory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, amen. So the next couple of weeks, next five weeks, we're going to be talking about how that we can grow and deepen and mature that faith. Don't miss it. Be a part of it. Whether you're watching online or being in here, I look forward to seeing you guys. If you need prayer after service, our team will be up here. We'd love to pray for you guys, and I know God's got some good stuff in store for you. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. Thank you.